Hello my friends and welcome back to another episode of Radical Radio Scotland. What a great conversation we had today with Martin from Mishnach. Mishnach are a grassroots activist group who advocate for the Gaelic language. So in this podcast we talk about the issues that are faced by Gaelic communities and what needs to be done to address these inequalities. Now look, if you enjoy conversations like this, then please do support the podcast by rating us 5 stars on Apple, Spotify or whatever you use to listen to it. Or you can just check us out on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash Radical Radio Scotland. Thank you so, so much and I really hope that you enjoy this fascinating conversation. Everybody, please put your hands together for Martin. Yeah, so thank you so much for coming on, Martin. I really do appreciate it. Uh, so you're here representing your organisation. Could you tell us a bit about your organisation, who they are, kind of the goals? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm representing uh, Mishnach, um, which is a Gaelic language grassroots activism group. Um, the word Mishnach means confidence or courage. Um, and based on, on an organisation of the same name in Ireland, which was founded um, back in the, in the 60s and then kind of re-established in the, in the early 2000s, basically um, campaigning for the, for the Gaelic language um, from a, a more radical, um, uh, progressive viewpoint, um, and also independently and at a grassroots level. Um, so as an organisation, we're kind of non-hierarchical um, uh, entity who can, can join and kind of um, take part in the group. Um, contribute their ideas. As with all activism groups, it kind of ends up being um, a few people who are more active and some people um, supporting us, but um, we do have a lot of support within the community, um, even, you know, in a, in, a, in a small group of around, around 30 who kind of consider the campaigns and um, uh, kind of deal with, deal with the decision making. That's cool. That's cool. I love that it's kind of non-hierarchical and stuff like that. You don't. There's a lot of organisations that that don't do that, but my, like my own trying to keep the kind of yeah the grassroots nature of it um, and not not be too formal. Um, yeah, um, yeah, you, you have to be kind of flexible and um, you know available to respond to stuff as well. Like uh, particularly with with grassroots, there's very few activists in, in the Gaelic world, and they'll have um, have jobs. <laughs> Uh, a lot of those jobs being in Gaelic development, which limits uh, what you can say publicly and your ability to campaign. So, um, yeah, you have to be quite flexible in who who's um, who's available to speak, who who can write articles, who can respond to consultations, and that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it is widely accepted that the Gaelic language um, in Scotland is considered an indigenous language, and then I read in your. Uh, radical plan for Gaelic that your organisation spoke about how one of the fundamental beliefs is that Gaels should be regarded as an indigenous ethnic group with the collective right to continue to exist as a distinct people. I was wondering if you could speak to that and tell me a bit, a bit more about that. Yeah, um, well I think historically that's how the, the Gaels have seen themselves in Scotland. And the more you kind of read about Scottish history, you, you see that it's been a kind of multilingual, multinational state almost, um, um, with the Gaeltacht, the Highland region, the Gaelic speaking region, seeing themselves as quite autonomous um, for large parts of our history. Um, and, you know, going right, right down to the, to the, the present day, all the um, Gaelic um, professor John McInnes referred to it as the detritus of a nation, um, as, as being what's left. Um, we think it's kind of um, it's reductive to um, to kind of deny uh, the diversity within within Scottish people. Okay, we're all white, but I mean, what does that mean? We can't. You can't. It's not progressive to use that label to kind of deny diversity, particularly when we look at you know what what is is white in in the United States of America. Um, Hispanic is kind of you know, has a different line in, in, in North America than it does in Europe, where they would very much be seen as, as, as white. So these things are not, you know, obviously, um, as a con it's an, an imposed concept. It's not uh, an area of uh, 
that I have any particular expertise in. There's other people in Mishnah who have um, done PhDs and talk, and talk more um, authoritatively on, on this type of subject. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not a progressive position to deny diversity. Um, the Gales are people within um, the nation of Scotland uh, and should be recognised as such. Um, I mean, that, that position isn't controversial in, in the sense that... Um, even in the when they were reviewing the hate crime legislation, Lord Brackadale um, kind of considered this question, and his position on it was that um, uh, there was a fairly strong argument that, Ga that Gaelic speaking Gaels belong to an ethnic group, an ethnic group, and he defined an ethnic group as must having a, a long shared history, a cultural tradition of its own, and that it would um, commonly also have one or more of the following uh, common geographical uh, origin a common language, a common literature, a common religion, or be a minority or oppressed um, group within a dominant or larger community. So, you know, the, the Gales, the Gaelic speakers kind of fit all those um, criteria pretty much. Um, so, you know, that is recognised to some degree. And we feel that it needs to be um, um, kind of given more formal recognition in terms of like where the rights of the speaker group um, stem from. Um, and and to, to ensure that policies to support Gaelic are not limited to linguistic policies, that they're social policies, that, you know, the Highland region has an Indigenous um, people and that people deserves investment and the right to live in their area and, and these type of things. Uh, some are like, where we feel Scotland is quite um, behind the times in a way. Um, uh, the discussions on, on these type of progressive issues and um, recognising diversity and um, rural development, rights of people to live in their communities, these type of things are, are not really uh, as strong here as they, as they could be. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Like, I think that was the first time I'd ever came across the concept was when I was reading that radical plan for Gaelic. And mm. usually when you read something like that, your kind of alarm bells do go off because usually the people that are kind of making that argument are like these British nationalists that are against immigration yeah. and stuff like that. But when I was reading the entirety of the plan, it came across that it's not that. It's all about progressive politics. It's all about ensuring that yeah, these communities that, are yeah. equipped to protect themselves. The other thing is to kind of rec recognise, to recognise that kind of, um, that group, that, that na sub-nationality, as it were. Um, and, it, you know, it's not, some people, I'm sure, would... Um, talk about you know Celtic mysticism and um, kind of genetics and nonsense like that um, but you know pe people can join a culture people can become Gales like they can become Scots um, by you know taking part in in the in the life of the community by living in, in the area by speaking the language by you know um, investing themselves in the culture so it's not to be exclusionary and to say that some people are Gales, some people are not, you know, to, in the first instance, to acknowledge that the fact that that, that um, community exists um, is an important step. And, you know, you don't become a Gale just by learning uh, Gaelic. There's more to it than that. You don't become French by learning French. Um, but that's not to say that you can't become French or you can't become a Gale, um, just like you can become a Scots. But by putting on a Scottish accent and still living in America, you're probably not qualifying <laughs> by moving here and, you know, getting a job and living in Scotland, then yes, we'll, we will see you as a Scot, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's such an interesting concept as well, because, I mean, it's such an important aspect of trying to battle climate change and stuff like that as well, like supporting Indigenous people all across South America, even in North America these kind of communities have traditionally lived harmoniously with the land and I was wondering if you could speak a bit to that like I don't really know too too well how the Gales as a people have interacted with the land but I know that they will have been severely impacted by the kind of unequal land distribution that we have in Scotland. Yeah you know in, a, in some ways what happens to Indigenous peoples across the new world um, happened uh, here first, um, the Gales traditionally lived on the land, but had no sense of 
of that kind of ownership. They didn't have a bit of paper to say they owned the lands. They just always lived there. So, you know, they had they had a right to that land by it being their land and they'd always lived there. Um, and this idea that kind of ownership was imposed from the outside, um, people came along, slipped the paper saying, well, actually they own this, so you need to move. Well, how did you come by that bit of paper? Where did that ownership stem from? And the same thing kind of happened in the New World. Colonialisers arrived and said, we own this um, based on what, <laughs> you know, that you've turned up with a bit of paper that you wrote in your language saying that you own it. Um, you know, so it suffered under, under that type of, um, um, you know, ownership and, and external imposition. So colonialism, essentially. Um, and the Gales, like um, people elsewhere were dispossessed. I should point out here that often, um, you know, I, I, we wouldn't be trying to equate the Gales to uh, Native Americans and other people who suffered. And we should acknowledge that once the Gales were, um, cleared from Scotland and oppressed and dispossessed, they then took part in that process elsewhere. So, you know, the Gales were both victims and um, participants in, in colonialism. Um, so we should acknowledge that as well. It's not, it's not um, to say that we are, you know, um, wholly the victims. Um, yeah. Gales did have a, have a, a part in colonialism elsewhere as well. Um, but I mean, uh, just kind of, between that point and your previous point, um, one point we talk about, um, uh, you know, in the, in the mid-19th century, the Gaelic-speaking population of Scotland, Ireland and the Isle of Man was, uh, was in the millions, you know, around 10, 11 million. Um, there was a significant wow. number of Gaels that spoke the Gaelic language in Europe. Um, so, you know, that, that's bigger than the Finnish nation, the Czech nation, the Slovene nation, or the Estonian nation, you know, it's a significant um, population. It's like, you know, Portugal having existed in the, in the mid 19th century and then today no longer existing. It's, it's a significant people um, within Europe who now basically um, barely exist. They have no nation, their language is under threat. Um, people have been kind of um, dispossessed and assimilated essentially um, and we we talk about that being um, you know a cultural or, or linguistic genocide it's people have been um, deliberately assimilated <coughs> um, or dispossessed uh, and you know it's important for for Scotland to, to recognize that it's not just all you know oh yes we are a multi multi-lingual uh, society we should promote Gaelic recognizing that we have that history and that, you know, a, a, a people, a nation uh, or a you know, uh, nation within our state has been essentially destroyed. Um, and we, we should kind of look to address that as part of the reason why, why we promote Gaelic today. Yeah. So how do you think that your kind of rural housing controls that you want to implement, how, how do you think that can impact that? Yeah, I think, you know, from the, from the clearances onwards, um, uh, Gales have suffered from, from that um, um, clearance. And, you know, initially clearance was, was largely economic. It was done for economic reasons. And uh, lots of thousands of families had to leave because the rents were increased, you know, so you can say it was an economic clearance even then. Sometimes more forcible means were used. Um, but, I mean, that process is kind of ongoing. Um, the, lack of economic power um, in, in the rural, rural areas of Scotland and the Highlands and Islands uh, means that people still have to leave. Uh, they still have are cleared economically, essentially. Um, so where we have improvements in, in Gaelic education in, in the Highlands, um, uh, here in Skye, Gaelic education has come on um, greatly. So we have um, generations of young people come out of school, uh, out of schools every year. Um, who are unable to find a job or, or get on the property ladder and therefore leave. So there's kind of there's no um, intergenerational momentum to the to the um, language development in the islands. Um, it's unsustainable for for the improvements we're making to try and uh, increase uh, Gaelic speakers in the islands for for every generation of kids that come out of the school for them to have to leave. So yeah, it's you know it's crucial. 
for the sustainability of the language and its heartland that young people are able, if they choose, some will obviously still want to go to Glasgow, um, go to university there and, and you know, uh, live and work elsewhere. But lots and lots of them will want to stay here. And certainly, you know, in my experience, lots of the ones who are in Glasgow would love to return and, you know, and actively look to do so, but are una unable to do so. Um, so addressing the housing crisis is really fundamental to, to language planning in, in, in Scotland. If we want there to be heartland, if we want there to be Gaelic speaking communities, then we urgently need to address um, the housing crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you often hear, and I'm very well aware of the difficulties with housing and Airbnb in Edinburgh and, and urban places as well. And, you know, it's not to say that's not bad, but there is a kind of, in, in an urban context, that is kind of gentrification. So people move out of the city centre and then they move to Leith and then uh, Leith gets gentrified, so they move to Musselburgh. You know, like you have that opportunity to, you know, it's not a good process, I'm not saying <laughs> that's okay. Um, but essentially, people are still able to live and work in Edinburgh or in and around Edinburgh, in and around Glasgow. What happens in the islands is basically, you know, you're either here or you're not. There's no down the roads. There's no area to yeah. gentrify. Like the islands are the islands. and There's not that many homes here. And basically, you know, the nearest place you could get somewhere would be Inverness, which is over two hours from the sky, um, which is not really the same thing. You're not going to live and work here. Um, so like that, that difference has to be recognised that it is kind of um, an all or nothing thing here. Um, it's not the case in, in an urban context, <clears throat> which is not to say that it doesn't need to address in Edinburgh as well, but just that there is that fundamental difference. Um, so in, in terms of what we're proposing, um, I know that the Scottish government have recently taken some positive steps to control um, short-term lets, um, but as Living Rent have, have highlighted, um, they kind of bowed to pressure from the Airbnb lobby and removed an over-provision over, over clause. Um, and that's kind of it's kind of crucial, it kind of fundamentally weakens the legislation. Um, if councils aren't able to say that there is an existing over over provision in areas, then it basically uh, takes the teeth out of the legislation. It means that um, to, in order to impose a control area, um, there need to be a, like a kind of uh, a kind of long winded process. There's no real guarantee that it would actually happen. It might take up to five years. Like that, that's no that's not good when you're facing a kind of a crisis now um you need we know there's an over provision in large areas of the highlands so let's just say that now let's just address it now um rather than have this sort of like consultation five year maybe it'll happen eventually type um legislation so we kind of strongly support living rent in their in their calls to reintroduce the over over provision clause to the short-term lets but i mean short-term lets is just one um, one aspect of a really um, complex issue, particularly with land ownership in the Highlands being um, feudal, essentially, there's huge estates. Um, we support a land value tax to, to try and address that. You know, that, that hits large estates if they have to pay a, a land value tax on that land. What, no matter what it's doing, then it kind of discourages holding land in that way um, and would hopefully break up some estates. Also, doesn't penalise development, so you're not paying a higher tax if you develop things on your land. Um, so it's, it's a very um, efficient and progressive tax um, that would hopefully try and address um, break up big estates. Um, you know, there's also um, crofting law. It's a kind of added complexity in in Scotland and the Highlands, um, and basically. What happened with crofting was very similar to what happened with council housing. So when, when Thatcher introduced the right to buy and essentially commodified, marketized um, council houses, a similar thing was done to crofting, which means you can um, decroft and you can sell and um, sell your croft assignment and that type of thing. So it's created a, essentially, it's marketized crofting and you now see crofts going um, for crazy sums of money. Basically, it's treated as if it's a freehold um, the, the kind of distinction that it's a croft assignment and not actual ownership are kind of near, neither here nor there. Um, and you see crofts, it's been crofts and um, on Harris 
um, market for 350, 450, 500,000 pounds. You know, it's a craft assignment. You don't even own that. You're buying the assignment <laughs> to the craft. Um, so, you know, that, that is addressed as well in the same way that, you know, the, the right to buy of council homes is addressed. The, the whole idea with crafting was to um, create a perpetual right to live in the land. And now it's basically, that's been, that's been destroyed. It no longer, no longer fulfills that purpose. Um, people kind of fought and died for the right to, to live in the land for crafting law. Uh, and it's now been privatized essentially and um, is sold to the highest bidder. So that is addressed. And I suppose the, the final point then is that, um, you know, in, in, the, in the Highlands, we often talk about affordable housing, social housing. We need a lot more social housing. We need it to be spread out and not just in the main towns. Um, but it's so bad in, in places like Skye and Harris and um, other parts of the Highlands that, you know, even if you move here as a professional, um, doctors, policemen, teachers um, can't find homes either. You know, so it's not necessarily just social housing. It's a, it's a, a problem across the kind of socioeconomic um, scale. Um, so we feel that in in some of the, in, in the islands where there's the language and the culture to think of as well, we should um, regulate the, the housing market essentially the same way that Jersey does. Um, so in Jersey, you have different status of people. Um, so you can't just, nobody can buy property in, in Jersey unless you have lived there for 10 years or have a job to go to. In, Jer in, in Jersey. And if you lose that job, you lose your right to own your home and have to sell it. So basically you have to be living and working there to own property. And if you don't, then you have to sell. Um, yeah, that kind of makes sense because you know, that will stop like all the second home stuff that goes yeah, on as well. and retirees. I think they're, they're managing retirees as well. It's a lot of, a lot, um, you see this in Cornwall, in Wales, the Lake District as well as the Highlands and obviously in Jersey. Um, people selling up retiring to the areas which you know you can accommodate a certain number of people doing that but when it becomes um, a tsunami of um, retirees and second homeowners who looks after them you know like the, 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 if you need hospital treatment we're talking Inverness um, in a lot of these areas so you know it's, it's not sustainable for it to be a retirement community or a second you know a second homes um, we need to look at controlling that um, for basically for the health of communities as well as for, for the Gaelic language. I think, you know, um, we've kind of often try and, and take Gaelic out of the kind of, out of its ghetto, as it were, and, and talk about it as part of, of wider um, um, social justice issues. Like Gaelic can't survive unless there's sustainable communities for it to survive in. You know, not everybody's going to speak Gaelic. We're not trying to turn the clock back, but we need to reach a point where these, where the communities in the Gaelic heartlands are sustainable communities where young people can raise families and work, uh, and that there's maximal opportunity for them to do so in Gaelic and, and for people who don't speak Gaelic to learn it. Um, but it, it needs much more radical thinking than, than we're seeing so far from from the Scottish government. Yeah, I do think. Yeah, for quite a while there. No, no, no. It's I love little little insights like that. It's it's definitely what we need to hear. We need to hear the perspective of people that are living in these communities. Um, I think going back as well, like talking about estates and stuff like that, what kind of gets lost in the conversation about them is how did they acquire their wealth? You know, how did they even come to be in the first place? I think there's there's a golf course down the road from me, and I, I kind of looked into the history of it, and it turned out it used to be an estate that was sold to a golf course and it was similar for like quite a few golf courses in the area. But then that family had made their wealth off of slave trading and stuff like that. And I think it's pretty similar in the, in the Highlands and Islands where all these big estates, you know, I think it's quite important to acknowledge that a lot of their money has came from colonialism and slave trading and other practices like that. And most other European countries have addressed kind of the big estates, the kind of feudal estates, um, you know, 100 or 200 years ago. And Scotland's kind of an outlier that we still have quite a feudal la um, land holding arrangement here. Um, you yeah. saw it you know, in Ireland, the part of their independence movement was 
breaking up all those estates and when they gained their independence if you owned a big estate it was parceled up and given to local people um you know we're, we're, perhaps, we're perhaps we're we're past that era now and um, we might have to go about it in a different way but that's where land value tax um, starts to encourage that and i think um um um, in Israel where they have land value tax if the land's abandoned it's just claimed by the state you know so you either pay the tax or the state takes the land and therefore you can give it out to, uh, to other people so you could look at doing something like that you know impose a tax on estates if people don't want to pay that tax then then fine the, the Scottish government confiscates the land and dishes out to local communities um, how, so how how likely do you think the Scottish government are to implement a kind of like a land value tax because like in my experience the people that will be lobbying the hardest will obviously be the estate owners who are obviously those who have the economic wealth to be able to kind of make the the government bend to their will which we say with airbnb in the short term let's thing you know you, you see legislation which is fairly good uh, and then fundamentally we can do the last hurdle by by lobby groups basically um I mean, the Green Party support it. I think the SNP have supported it previously, um, a, a, a good while ago now. So it's, it's been kicked around. It's recognised as as a very progressive and um, efficient tax, you know. I, I, and you know, the SNP have previously campaigned on on replacing the council tax. I think council tax and its banding system is so outdated and so. Basically, people are scared to tamper with it because of <laughs> it's quite controversial. Um, so they're trying to leave it as long as they can. Um, the Green Party being part of the government, hopefully, will kind of reignite a conversation around reforming local tax. Um, but as with all these things, you kind of you have to just campaign for what for what's right or for what you believe in. Uh, how likely is this to happen? So a kind of another question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just like I would say that it, for me it comes to the point where this would be this issue could be tackled if we were trying to just restructure the whole economic system opposed to just kind of going for these individual taxes and laws. Yeah, and, that, that, and essentially that there's never there's never one solution anyway. Um, you know, land value tax isn't isn't a uh, kind of silver bullet that's going to solve this issue. It's part of a package of of measures, uh, as is you know control of short term lets. So I think it is it's a written a written branch reform, which is necessary for um, you know the planet, <laughs> for an environment, for us to have a a world to live in, um, the survival of our species. It kind of um, it's becoming more and more apparent that we need to a written written branch reform of of our economic priorities, um, and yeah. So again, that's what Mishnah is all about. It's trying to um, highlight the fact that like, Gaelic isn't, you know, it's not a set of words and grammar points that exists in a vacuum. It's it's people, it's culture, it's uh, a language that lives in in a, in a territory and a people and a culture. Um, and Gaelic speakers are affected by these economic um, kind of um, inequalities and um, structural um, uh, structural biases uh, against rural areas. Uh, yeah. they, they need addressed for the language to have to have a secure future. And I do feel like that point is often missed. Like I was reading articles about how Gaelic is. Kind of shifting towards being more of a network language than an actual like a community language and obviously everything mm -hmm. that we've been speaking about is what's kind of because it does it does have a lot of momentum as a network language so how do we kind of translate that into ensuring it's a community language and to get all those people in the networks to move <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes i mean there is i, I was involved in the, the duolingo course as well, um, and we're kind of past. Um, we've had 1.1 million people start the course. Um, there's 430,000 still actively uh, using it at the moment. Some people will, will have finished. Some people will have lost interest. But um, that's a, a huge increase in the number of people who've taken an interest in the Gaelic language. 
um, which is great. Um, obviously, the extent to which they'll uh, use the language, you know, how many of them re will reach fluency is another question. Um, there is this tendency to kind of equate uh, a native a native speaker who grew up um, the first language was Gaelic, only learned English at school. You know, grew up with the tradition and the culture, the song, the, the storytelling, the history. Um, you know, when they pass away and we're replacing them in a census form with somebody who can say Kimura Hau because they've done a couple of lessons of Duolingo is not the same thing. Uh, you know, it's not a sustainable position to see it like that. Um, you know, there will always be um, an element of uh, of the network language of you know the Gales have always lived in big cities. Um, there's you know a, a, a vibrant galaxy in, in Glasgow, particularly. Um, but we often we see that you know historically that tends not to last beyond a generation or two, and um, it's difficult for there to be um, generational momentum in that. You know, um, through the clearances, there was like a million Irish um, or more moved to the to North America. You know, like in Boston and New York, places like that. Huge, huge numbers of of Gaelic speakers moving over there, um, and to places like Glasgow. Um, and the language kind of disappeared within um, one or two generations. Um, so it's it's rare for for languages languages to exist without a territory. It doesn't happen very often. You get academic projects like Esperanto manage it. Um, you get um, things like Yiddish, where there's a, a really, really strong religious um, underpinning for that. Um, that means that people kind of with the language tend to stick together um, and preserve that. Um, where that's not the case, there's not a lot of evidence for the survival of, of network languages. Um, so, yeah, we feel that in the first instance, we still have communities left. Yes, they're in a, in a poor state and, and threatened, but they still exist and we need to do everything in our power to preserve them and um, to strengthen them while we still have them. While at the same time, encouraging the network um, use of Gaelic across Scotland and internationally. Um, and we would see that as almost it, it's at least to high level strategic priorities is the preservation of of the of the, the native Gaelic speaking communities in place in the Highlands and Islands, and then separately the promotion of Gaelic nationally and internationally. Um, those are two separate things essentially, and they need to be viewed from a strategic perspective as two separate things. Um, and I think what's clear is that you know, there are things that are, are going really well in terms of the um, promotion of Gaelic uh, nationally, but we're still seeing massive contractions in the, in the heartlands. So um, there's a big debate just now about, about that. There was research um, published um, two years ago now, in 2020 in the summer, um, basically showed showed the kind of continued uh, continued decline in the heartlands and predicting that you know Gaelic as a as any form of community language is about 10 years left. Um, that's a kind of time scale um, just in terms of intergenerational transmission, parents wow. speaking it to their kids, people being brought up with the language, um, the proportion of native speakers in the islands who are, who are older above 60, you know, um, that needs addressed. It needs addressed urgently. Um, it needs, you know, a lot of the policies I'm, I've been talking about in terms of housing. It needs a policy in terms of Gaelic jobs uh, and much more strategic provision of, of well-paid Gaelic jobs to communities. We talk quite a lot about um, how for Gaelic speakers, you know, the, the stable careers are teaching or the media with the BBC Whereas actual community development officers are one of are probably the most uh, crucial role in development of Gaelic, and those those jobs tend to be on six months, one year, two year contracts. Uh, they tend to be kind of graduate level jobs. There's no real structure for um, a career in that. 
um, that that needs to be created. There needs to be a, um, a kind of long term stable career in community development, and that needs to be seen as an attractive proposition for for GAI speakers alongside teaching in schools and uh, the media. And the community development aspect is is hugely important, and it's massively undervalued at present. Um, I think that's like such a mental a mental thing that you just said. Ten there's ten years essentially that the Gaelic language has. That's like alarm bells crisis point. Really, it should be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously, the best time to act on this issue was like twenty years ago, thirty years ago, forty yeah. years ago. But just when you hear that, that's that's insane. Sorry, once. Yeah, it's it's scary. It's, and you know, for for us to live through that. Um, the, the the death of, of Gaelic as a, as a community language in Scotland, something that's been the case in Scotland, was established by Gaelic speakers. Um, it is crazy. And for it to happen under a Scottish National Party government as well um, is, is all pretty, pretty crazy. Um, and for all you hear online often that, that Gaelic's been forced on us by the SNP and it's a, a nationalist plot, Almost all the support structures and legislation um, uh, to promote Gaelic were introduced prior to the SNP taking over. They were introduced either by the Tories um, in terms of broadcasting and Gaelic education back in the kind of 80s and 90s, and then by, by the yeah. Labour Lib, Lib Dem coalition. Was there not um, someone in Margaret in Thatcher's areas. government that set up? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the Tories the actually kicked the ball. Kicked, um, kicked things off in terms yeah. of broadcasting. So, you know, the, the major steps forward that have been taken in, in promoting Gaelic were, were taken by the Tories and the Labour Lib Dem co coalition in the Scottish Parliament. So the SNP have really just kept things going that were already established. They haven't introduced anything um, new or substantial since they took power, um, which is really disappointing. <laughs> You feel like they're almost running scared of the accusation that it's a nationalist project or something like that, but there, there's cross-party support. Um, and I think there's cross-party support for, for doing more than we're currently doing. Um, and, you know, in my, in my view, if the Tories are happy with it, then we're definitely not doing enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, cross-party support is good, but we should really be pushing the boundaries of that support, you know, rather than taking a kind of, um, right down the centre, middle of the road approach. Yeah, um, we should be we should be taking um, you know certain aspects of that cross party support to its, yeah. to, to the edges of its comfort zone, as it were. Yeah, um, this does this does kind of strike me as more of a, a class issue as well. I was I, I was reading the report and it was talking about how a lot of people in the Gaelic communities are like really poor and how that kind of equates to all of these economic issues that Gaelic communities are suffering are the same, well, not the same, but similar to what working class people across the rest of Scotland are facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's the support that those people need as well. I think there's, there's a real tendency, um, I feel, in, to forget that or we, we often talk in Gaelic of so, so Gaelic, the Gaelic world, um, and it tends to refer to those of us who are involved in Gaelic development. Um, but when we look at um, who actually speaks Gaelic day to day, was um, the research done in the islands recently, the research that showed that um, there's around 10 years left, it kind of identified that there's around 11,000 native habitual Gaelic speakers in the islands, 11,000. Um, you know, and those are primarily going to be fishermen and crofters, um, people, in, people in kind of traditional industries, and, um, traditional ways of life, older people um, in the islands. And they're, they're not part of this cell in the Gaelic. Um, they just live their lives through Gaelic. They maybe listen to the radio. In fact, they definitely listen to the radio. <laughs> uh, radio and Gael. Um but other than that, they're not really engaged by this kind of Gaelic development. There's almost a sense that this cell the Gaelic is actually Gnivachus the Gaelic, the Gaelic industry, yeah, like the kind of business of Gaelic as opposed to the, the people who speak it. 
Um, and I think that's where the, the class thing comes in. Those, those kind of native everyday users of Gaelic, what's left of the community, tend to be from the lower um, socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and typically, when, we, when we're seeing um, developments in, in urban settings and um, Gaelic medium education, does tend to be more middle class people who take that up. Um, I know there, there's steps being taken now. The, the, like the fourth Gaelic schools can be in Calton in the east end of Glasgow, which is great, great to see. Hopefully, you know, it is becoming more inclusive. But certainly, <clears throat> while, um, while I was working as an architect in Glasgow, I often heard people buying flats in Deniston in areas like that, and then conversation being around, oh, but what about the schools? And then the answer was always, yeah, just go to the Gaelic medium because that's not got a catchment area. So it was definitely being used by <clears throat> kind of middle class people to circumvent catchment areas um, and buy property in areas with you know less good catchment area schools. <clears throat> so we need, we need to be aware of that and you know um, recognize the fact that um, the, the native speakers in, in the islands are kind of people who are marginalized in a way in, in an economic sense uh, in society anyway and that they need support for that and there's also a sense that um, you know when we talk about supporting native speaking communities in the islands versus um, the communities in the cities I mean obviously there's learners and natives in the cities and there's learners and natives in the islands um, but there's a kind of structural bias uh, and everything we do towards urban centres, you know, uh, not just in a kind of Gaelic promotion of Gaelic point of view, um, and in all aspects of, of of civic life, you know, we all pay our taxes to you know national ballet and to the museums and galleries and all the cultural um, trappings of of the Scottish states, which are based in Glasgow and Edinburgh, you know. So that's come out of my taxes, but how often do I get through to the national galleries? Yeah, there is there is that kind of inbuilt bias towards urban urbanization, um, a centralization, um, a pool of resources and of people and of um, investment to, to urban centres, which means that infrastructure is poor, that you know cultural things are poor, that um, wages are lower, that people it's harder to organise things in in a rural context than it is in an urban one. It costs more. People have to travel. It's harder to get people together. When you do organise an event, the turnout is going to be much, much lower. It, you know, so the whole thing is is a lot more work for much less um, kind of bang for your buck, I suppose, than you would get in, in the cities. Yeah. So, you know, that's that, a structural that bias. As well, it does need addressed. You, what you were talking about earlier in regards to, like, Inverness being the closest hospital for you in Sky, and that's like two hours away. You know, that's something that I've seen a lot of um, Gaelic speakers and people from the Highlands and Islands talk about, is how that is one of the only hospitals, well, like the biggest hospital, really. Yeah, depend depending on the care you need. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But for, for a lot of stuff, I mean, I know people, um, you have to go to Inverness um, um, for, mater for kind of maternity hospital. And I know people in the north end of Skye who... Have then had have had difficulties and had to travel to Aberdeen regularly with their newborn child, um, and that's a fair distance to be yeah. doing regularly. Yeah, because I don't think people um, in the cities kind of understand just how poor infrastructure is in in the Highlands and Islands. Like when you hear stories like that, having to travel from Sky to Aberdeen regularly with a newborn, yeah. it's insane. Yeah, it is. It is an awful lot of, of traveling for to access basic services. Um, you know, the, the roads are terrible. The transport, the public transport, is kind of limited to non-existent. Um, there are huge kind of um, inequalities in terms of like the social provision in, in rural areas. Um, you know, and it feels like it's kind of you know, to touch on, on tourism, very much like um, we had kind of um, the kelp industry and then we had the sheep farming and there tends to be, um, the Highlands has always been viewed from 
from outside and in a very simplified uh, way where the economic output of the Highlands is just, oh, well, kelp will do that. Oh, no, that's, that's falling apart. Sheep, let's do that. Complete monoculture, overgrazing, completely destroyed itself. That falls apart. And the kind of latest incarnation of that is tourism. That's all the Highlands are good for. So just throw all our eggs in that basket, let it suffocate the communities, destroy the roads. And then what? You know, it's it's short-sighted. It's not, it's not to say that tourism isn't going to be important. It's a, a beautiful area and people are going to want to come and see it and create an interesting health, history and culture. Um, uh, tourism is going to be important to the Highlands and it should be. But it has to be measured and planned and sustainable and it has to not suffocate uh, diversity and communities and um you know it, 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 at the moment it's suffocating uh, economic diversity if you're running a business here where do your staff live you know how, how do you get people to come and work for you when they can't find homes uh, and you know it's just there's no real <laughs> there's nothing you can really do about that it needs to be it needs to be interventionist. It needs the government to, to do something about it. Um, it needs them to sort of provide the infrastructure for tourism to ensure that tourism is um, kept at a sustainable level and, and to control its impact through things like who can buy homes here, what they use those homes for um, in terms of short-term lets. You know, it needs the government to think strategically about it and to view the area holistically and not just as a kind of monoculture yeah yeah i think one of the things that i read as well in the radical plan for gaelic was the the creation of these new residential communities which were centered around mm -hmm. the language could you tell us a bit more about them and um, so so in wales there's um, at a national level there's a requirement to produce a language impact assessment and um, for as part of the planning process so developers or um, people looking for planning permission have to produce a, a language impact assessment in areas where um, there's not a high level of, of, of Welsh language use, so that might just be providing signage um, in the Welsh language. But in areas where there's a, a high social density, where you know 20%, um, 40%, 60% of local people speak speak Welsh, um, it, the onus is then on the on the developer to provide housing for for Welsh speakers um, and to not negatively impact the social density of speakers in that area. So that's a huge responsibility. Um, and it shows that if there was a political will to do something more, uh, much, much more could be done. Uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to the willingness of the Scottish government to take steps to protect the heartland communities um, and to protect the use of, of Gaelic as an everyday spoken language. Um, so there's an awful lot we can learn from the Welsh context and what they're willing to do. Ireland started to introduce that in terms of the, in their Gaeltacht areas, the um, areas where Irish is spoken as a, as a kind of, well, the recognised areas where, where Irish is the, the default language. Um, a similar, similar situation there where developers have to um, provide housing for Irish speakers and to take steps to avoid um, weakening the language in, in the area. Um, there's obviously no such, uh, no such measures in Scotland. Um, so any, any new houses that are built are just basically on the market kind of thing. So as I say, it's political will, and that is unfortunately severely lacking in, in Scotland currently. Yeah. And how, how important do you think that restructuring the economic system is and pre preserving these Gaelic communities? Yeah, I think, I think we've touched on like, the various kind of policies and um, as I said, it's kind of there's no single policy that is, is a kind of um, um, magic bullet for this that's going to solve um, <laughs> hundreds of years of um, kind of economic and political marginalisation of, of the Gaelic people. Um, uh, there's, there's so so many things need addressed, and it is a root and branch reform of of the economic system fundamentally. Um, you know, our, we have an economic system that puts profit uh, as as the main as its main driver in raison d'etre um, 
uh, exponential growth and profit are the kind of driving factors in the economy, and that is just fundamentally um, unsustainable, um, and and leads to economic and marginalisation of, of particularly rural areas. Um, I mean, the UK has got an incredibly centralised economy around the southeast of England um, and, and London. So, and then uh, you know, regionally in Scotland, um, again, it's kind of towards the central belt. Our, our, our economic structure is built around kind of centralisation and, and drawing resources and people and everything away from, from the periphery. Um, you know, again, and there's so many examples internationally and around Europe of countries who plan better for this, like strategic planning is something that is completely lacking in Scotland and the UK in almost every sphere of life, <laughs> every level. But the idea that you would have a strategic plan for where you want to be um, and how you're going to get there at a kind of um, detailed level <laughs> with targets and, and, you know, set targets and metrics, how you're going to measure that, pro measure progress. Um, places like Norway, there's much more of a sense that if you're born in a community, you have a right to live in that community. You know, a child born in, in a rural community in Skye should have the opportunity to grow up in that community and choose to continue to live there. Like it's, not, it's not fair for kids born in certain areas to have to move, you know, to not have a future in their, in their own community. And I think we, even just idealistically to kind of set that as a, as a goal that people can do that, you know, obviously it might not always be possible, but people have a right to live certainly in, in their local area, if not their local town, you know, you could set it at a, a, a kind of a realistic um, geographical area, um, proximity to, to your the town of your birth or whatever. Um, but at the moment, it's just, you know, a large percentage of the Scottish population are born into places where they will, they have no future. They will have to leave, um, mm -hmm. which I think is unfair. Yeah. So how important do you think that, like, self-governance and political autonomy will be for Gaelic communities? Specifically, the kind of, the, the residential communities that we were talking about, but kind of more broadly as well in regards to the highlands and islands in general. Yeah, well, certainly rural areas are, are massively disempowered. Um, and I would hope that as a process of, of Scotland gaining um, political independence and autonomy, that, that we would pass that on to communities. I'm not under any illusions that that's going to happen and there's not going to be a, a fight to, to ensure that it does happen. Um, but yeah, local autonomy is, is of fundamental importance. And I think... Um, for, for guy speakers in particular, in particular, who suffered for so long economic marginalisation and this idea, which was particularly after the Second World War, that basically, if you want to get ahead in life, you need to stop speaking Gaelic, was the feeling, you know, um, soldiers, soldiers had been away and seen horrors in, in war, loads of them hadn't returned, the communities suffered massively because of that. English speakers, speakers tried, um, started to move in. Um, because the islands had lost so many young men in, in, in the war. So families started to become mixed language. There was just a sense that, you know, the gig was up, as it were, and that to get ahead, people needed to speak English. Um, and obviously the state <laughs> at the time was doing absolutely nothing to promote the Gaelic language or um, uh, and encourage them to, um, to use it. So uh, unfortunately, the older generation um, kind of grew up with that baggage of um, you don't speak out to people younger than yourself, like um, inter intergenerational transmission stopped. So there's a real kind of um, sense that um, Gaelic, the Gaelic language represents economic marginalisation um, and that if you want to progress and be successful, you know, you speak English essentially. Um, that, that's very hard to break down and it, it needs... Uh, quite, you know, radically and aggressive process of economic uh, empowerment uh, in those communities. Um, I mean, when we look at Scottish local democracy, again, Lankar kind of land ownership is, is 
broken. It is massively broken. Highland Council as a as a council area is enormous. Uh, yeah, bigger than some countries in Europe. And you know, our, our local democracy isn't even as powerful as it should be. Like our Scottish local democracy is underpowered and massively oversized. So we need more powerful, smaller, more local um, local government would be a huge step. Um, and and just like participatory budget budgeting, you know, involving local people in what where their tax money is spent, their, their priorities locally, in a Gaelic language context, what what type of supports does Gaelic need in, in your community? Because it will be different. Um, you know, not only in the kind of traditional uh, rural communities, the urban communities, there'll be a difference there. But there's a difference again between yeah, you know, a, a massive difference between uh, a traditional Gaelic speaking area where there's now only 20% people of people speak Gaelic to one where there's 40% and one where there's 60%. And the very few left where there are 60%. Um, you know, so it's about having strategic priorities that are appropriate to the local context and empowering people to take action. Uh, and then you can start to say, um, well, you know, take action, then here's the tools to do so. There's a real tendency at the moment when you hear it from, from uh, the Scottish government, you hear it from people within Gaelic development, all you need to do is speak the language. If, if all Gaelic speakers just spoke it, then we'd be fine, which is just, it's so um, neoliberal. It's, it's, you know, I, I was looking through correspondence that Mishnah had had with the Scottish government previously, and we had a letter back from John Swinney on, on a, a topic where he just made the case for um, growing the attractiveness of Gaelic as if it's some commodity that we need to get people to just choose off the shelf. And re remember, this is a, a commodity that's sitting alongside English with, you know, Netflix and the Xbox and Hollywood. And, you know, there is just, there's no way to compete with the, the, the cultural behemoth that is the English language and its kind of cultural appeal and what it has. You can't compete. What you have to do is present you know, an alternative and an additional richness in our language. Uh, you know, there's a fundamental um, misconception of what we're trying to achieve here and what is possible to achieve and how you should view the language. It's not a commodity. We're not trying to sell it to people. You know, Gales and Scotland have a right to exist um, and, and need to be supported. Um, and the Scottish government has a role in facilitating them to use a language and to promoting the use of that language, not not through the appeal of Gaelic, but through um, social measures that um, encourage, promote, and support the use of the language. There, there won't be a Gaelic Netflix. You know, there won't be Gaelic Call of Duty or whatever else um, folk are doing. You know, people will be bilingual. They need to have uh, an, an enriching, empowering, additional reason to use to use Gaelic, and that has to be something that's done naturally in communities of speakers um this, this is where it comes back to, to kind of intergenerational momentum as well when you have a network community i might be a passionate um gaelic language activist an advocate and then you have a child you raise that child in the hope that they will also feel that way but you can't guarantee that you know like the next generation makes their own decisions yeah parents have an influence on them and we can we can give them the power to speak to speak gaelic but it's very hard um, to maintain that when it's not something that's done naturally, because in every in every group there will be people who feel very strongly about something, and people who feel kind of meh. If there's folk around, then maybe you know. But you can't expect everybody to be an activist. It's unrealistic in any any kind of walk of life that that you know everybody's going to be an activist. So there has to be situations where it's just the done thing in the community. Um, and that's what we need to strive to promote, to create, to establish, to re-establish, um, to nurture in any way that we can. And if we don't do that, then we're basically relying on every generation having its activists and every generation kind of, you know, redoing the work of the previous one, essentially. Like, you don't see that there's any, there's going to be a, a kind of generational momentum then. And do you think that, the gales would benefit from a kind of like their own parliament the way that the kind of the sami people in finland 
have have their own parliament, I'm sure. Well, potentially. Um, it's, again, it's, it's a, a topic that's been kicked around a bit recently in, in Gaelic circles. Um, it's something Mishnach have mentioned previously. Um, we see a place for it, but certainly don't see it as um, you know the centerpiece of of uh, language revitalization. Yeah. There's a question um, when we talk about things like um, recognizing the Gaels as a people. Obviously, there's quite a lot of Gaels who don't speak Gaelic. Um, those things are not exclusive, um, kind of mutually exclusive. I think we see it as more um, um, a social function, a kind of corrective historical function, and um, something that empowers communities, but not necessarily as um, as a kind of an instrument for um, exclusively for language promotion, as it were. You know, because obviously, who would have membership of the group? Um, what you know, what language would you use and whatnot? But there's there's a place for empowering people anyway. Uh, there's a place for powering Gales, whether they speak Gaelic or not. There's a, a place for empowering rural communities. So I think we see the value in considering it. Um, there's lots of practical questions to, to be asked about it, but I think there's a reluctance uh, currently in, in Gaelic circles to consider ideas um, and to kind of explore how they might operate. There's a number of things that have been put forward that have been immediately kind of um, poo-pooed for um, a number of kind of practical questions that you could basically level against anything you know mm-hmm. well we need to investigate how membership um, will be uh, will be operated who will have membership um, how would that work how would voting rights work what would the powers be you know the, yeah nobody's designs what what something like that would look like there's a number a number of examples around the world that we could look at um and there's a number of reasons why we might do so. Um, not necessarily as the primary driver of language revitalization, as I mentioned, but as a, a general process of empowerment and um, kind of economic and social empowerment for a group of people who have been marginalized historically. Um, so <laughs> and there's, there's various bodies that could pr- perform that role as well, not necessarily a parliament. And I think from Mishnach's point of view, um, we we see that we try as an organisation not to just say to criticise uh, too much what is what's happening. You know, there's lots of things that are happening that are, that are good, uh, and what has happened over the last forty years of of um, gag language um, kind of activism and um, promotion has helped. <laughs> it's not, it's been far from enough, um, obviously. Um, so we we try and um, try and be positive in our contributions, and we try and um, um, put forward policies which are in place elsewhere, which have had positive impacts elsewhere. Um, we've got a number of very knowledgeable and um, uh, kind of academics that contribute to our our, um, our policy papers um, and the policies that we promote. For instance, in the, the radical plan for Gaelic, it's it's not even radical. <laughs> Most of those policies are in place in Wales. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, it's radical in a Scottish context, and we hope we we talked a lot about kind of Overton windows and um, you know moving the bar of what's what's acceptable or feasible or realistic. Um, obviously, we're not expecting people to kind of pick up our manifesto or or our radical plan for Gaelic and implement every policy what we're demonstrating is that there's you know we're not helpless here there's, a, there's so many things that could be done here they are <laughs> why not do some of them you know is, is our kind of strategy um, rather than just kind of endlessly saying more needs to be done we're, we're telling you what we think should be done yeah somebody should explore some of those ideas somebody should um, you know go to visit the sami people and see what what they're doing go and see what's happening in canada what's working there what's working in hawaii what's working in new zealand and um, what's working in wales what's working in ireland what's not working um you know uh, the the gaelic plan model that we have in scotland and um, this policy of kind of public bodies have to prepare a gaelic language plan was based on the policy that they had in wales kind of like in the early 2000s they quite quickly realised that it wasn't really all that effective in Wales and changed a completely new policy, a completely new structure with a language commissioner and whatnot. And Scotland's not changed at all. Mm-hmm. 
we've just still got that that policy, which you know it's not a bad thing that police Scotland have a Gaelic language plan, but in reality, if I'm arrested, am I going to speak Gaelic to them? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> yeah. You know, like how much how much benefit how, how much good does that do in terms of the the natural daily use of the language? You know, as I say, I'm not saying it's it's a bad thing or it shouldn't happen, but it shouldn't be the be all and end all. It shouldn't be the kind of main drive of Gaelic language development in Scotland is getting pol- polis written in the cars. It's something that, yeah, is done by and by while we actually promote the daily use of the language in social contexts, um, which, again, they've, they've taken steps to improve in Wales and they've taken steps to improve in Ireland. I think that pretty much wraps up everything that I wanted to talk about. Was there anything else that you wanted to say? Uh, I know. I feel like covered a lot. Covered a lot. I know. Um, yeah, that's what you could potentially say. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose uh, it depends who, who your listeners are. The last question you had was about that being spoken across Scotland. Um, it's kind of relevance to Scotland nationally. Is that something you yeah, want to yeah. talk about? Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean... Whenever you look at a map of Scotland, all, all of the the places do seem to be translated from or like derived from Gaelic. I know that here in Glasgow, Glasgow is, is from Gaelic and and so on. And I think people kind of underestimate the historical importance of the language. Yeah, the, the place names in Scotland tell tell a, a story all, all across the country and kind of ironically that um, in the places where the language is most spoken, um, Today in the, in the Western Isles and Sky, um, most of the place names are Norse, <laughs> um, and even the name for the Western Isles, Inchigal, um, means the land of the foreigner, um, and it was used when Scotland was Gaelic speaking, and the Norse um, held the, the Western Isles. Um, so it's kind of ironic um, that, that that is the, the name, and now the Gaels have kind of become a foreigner in their own lands, <laughs> and only the people who live there. Um, you know, the, the last communities who use the language. Um, but I mean, there's a huge, um, huge lack of understanding in, in Scotland as to the, the place of the Gaelic language in, in Scotland's story. Um, you know, um, my grandpa was a proud Doric speaker, a very proud of kind of Scots heritage as well. Um, Scotland's been a kind of a multilingual uh, nation. But essentially, the the state of of Scotland or Awapa was established by Gaelic speakers when the Gaels kind of um, took over the the kingship of the Picts and and those two kingdoms joined. That's when Scotland was established and it was established as a Gaelic speaking country. And throughout its history, you know, the the assimilation of the different English kingdoms into one England, um, you can see that that might have happened encompassing the Lothian and the borders if it hadn't been for this kind of cultural identity and distinct distinctiveness of um that we had here from from the kind of the Gaelic founding of Scotland that gave it gave us the impetus to protect a separate kingdom um and even as you go through the years and the Stuarts um and the, the kind of kingdom of Scotland became separate from the kingdom of the Isles the, the kingdom of Scots there was still massively bilingual um, Gaelic and Scots were used um, across different areas of the Kingdom of Scotland and separately there was also the, the Kingdom of the Isles um, the Lordship of the Isles normally in English but in, in Gaelic it's often Riach the Neolin, the Kingdom of the Isles um, so like, Gaelic's been a, a hugely important and almost there was a process of othering started when when the, the, the Stuart Kings were trying to assert their authority over the islands and it became you know the Scots-speaking kings in the south against the barbarian um, tribes in the north that spoke Gaelic, and kind of as part of that, um, um, Scot- prior to that, um, Scots was called English, essentially English, um, and and Gaelic was called Scottish or Scottish, um, you know, and, and there was a kind of rebranding done through that that. Period of turmoil that um, Gaelic became known as Erse, as Irish, 
mm-hmm. um, and they rebranded what um, you know Lowland Scots as, as Scots essentially. Um, so there's a kind of a, a process of othering um, of making of making Gaelic foreign to Scotland, um, and we kind of still live with the, the, the hangover of that times. So obviously, the, the Jacobite rebellions kind of furthered that sense that the Northerners were kind of causing trouble and. Um, there was a religious divide as well, where the Highlands remained Catholic, where the um, Molins had largely uh, become Protestant. Um, and, you know that kind of tying in. Um, so there's a lot of baggage there in terms of the modern nation of Scotland. It's all, um, kind of we really need to look into that and address it, and kind of come to terms with it and what it means for us today uh, in terms of where the Gaelic language sits and our responsibility to it. Um, but there's no doubt it's it's the Scottish language, one of the Scottish languages. Um, it developed distinctly in Scotland, although it's obviously of um, the same historical ancestral language as, as the modern Irish language. Um, it developed independently, autonomously in, in Scotland. And so it's one of our native languages and it's had a huge influence in the country right across there's actually Gaelic derived place names in the north of England uh, and whether or not the, the mistake um, people often make looking back in maps and talk about Gaelic wasn't spoken here what they might mean um, is that Gaelic was never a majority language here that might be true um, but it was certainly you know in, in areas of the Lowland, uh, the Lowlands and Lothian and places like that maybe uh, in the east coast where it wasn't ever the majority language there were certainly at one point, you're talking 30% of the population there would have spoken it, or, you know, a significant minority would yeah. have spoken it that led to place names being established um, as far away as in the north of England. So, I mean, that that history is, is there. Um, yeah. And, and I think that areas. also, that does kind of hark back to what you're talking about, how uh, it was kind of working class people ordinary people that would be speaking Gaelic at those times so it wouldn't necessarily be reflected in place names and places where there was large populations of people speaking Gaelic simply because the people in power at that time weren't speaking Gaelic Mm -hmm. whereas it was more kind of ordinary yeah there's been various um you know colonial policies to assimilate the the upper class of, of of the Gaelic kingdom so even when there was still a kind of functioning social hierarchy in the highlands there was a, a colonial intention to um assimilate the, the ruling class essentially so the the lords the lords and the um the upper class of the Gaelic world became anglicized through the policy of of, of the state kind of thing um so it left it left the kind of the, the Gaelic body politic without a leadership essentially it was it was ordinary people who who used the language then um so i mean that's certainly from from um uh, jack about times onwards i think they were the last kind of the last hurrah of of a kind of gaelic speaking elite um before that was kind of um, destroyed and, and and you know that that coincided with the the kind of um enforced marketization of the highlands and the, the estates becoming um from their previous kind of feudal um, clan chief and and um, and people working the land to a much more transactional relationship um, between between the, the lairds and their and their people, one that was uh, ended when it was no longer economically um, advantageous to the to the laird, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the story of of Gaelic in Scotland is is hugely interesting and it hugely enriches. Scotland as a place and as a society that we have that. It's a shame that it's um, that we've uh, lost so much of it. Um, but as I say, it's, it's not too late, and I think it's great that more people are taking an interest in it. I would encourage everybody to to take up Duolingo to, yeah. to look at the new um, Speak Gaelic teaching materials as well, um, to learn with to learn the language, to engage with um, with our history as, as a country, a multilingual country, uh, and to and to do what you can to support Gaelic in the Highlands and Islands and um and in your local community wherever you are. Yeah. I don't think people really understand how much Scotland is dragging its heels in regards to this until 
well, for in my experience anyway, when I left Scotland to go travelling around South America, everyone I would meet, they would be like, oh, you're from Scotland, that's cool. Have you got your own language? And I'd be like, yeah, do I have our own language? We've got Gaelic, but like, no one speaks it. Whereas everyone I would meet, yeah. people from Ireland, people from Spain, all over, everyone's speaking their own language. And you're like, wow, we, we are so far behind it on the times with us. Yeah. There's a real um, Scottish cringe, I feel like that. I know it's a kind of almost a cliche in itself, but it is so, it is so true um, how much we kind of feel not necessarily ashamed, not certainly consciously ashamed, but like just to be a bit disparaging of of Scottish culture. And it's only when you're abroad and kind of see other people and them kind of being proud and kind of and them being taken aback that we are not more um, proud of our of our heritage and our culture and our languages. You kind of realise, hmm, there's something wrong with us. Why are we? Why are we like this? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I see it as you know, there's a couple of examples. Um, um the, the ocean oceanic tales was a big controversy um james mcverson wrote wrote down a kind of epic saga of, of the gallic tales about the fingalian legends finn mccool and, and, and ocean heroes um he kind of packaged that in a way that was appropriate to the kind of Napole- napoleonic era uh, something a process i suppose that was going, ongoing in other countries too in finland um, their kind of national sagas were written down in a kind of more uh um, a, a style and a format appropriate to the times um, and there was a huge controversy and um, McPherson was kind of ridiculed when it transpired that he had um, embellished and added to and quite a lot of it was his own work essentially you know, he'd, he'd, it wasn't you know, a collection of things he'd heard or been told he'd added quite a lot to it which is just, it's ridiculous because it was happening in other European societies where you kind of take folklore and traditions and, and bits of stories and package them in a, kind of, in a, in a culturally appropriate um, appropriate to their time um, format. You know, that's traditions evolving. They've always evolved. Stories evolve. People add to them. Uh, and we, we take our traditions and make them appropriate for our times. So the fact that, you know, it happened in other European countries and were ce- celebrated as masterworks happened in our country and it's ridiculed and, oh, we can't talk about him anymore. What a con man. Um, and, and likewise for the Scots language, um, what, again, what happened with Norwegian and Catalan and um, many European languages where they're, they're very similar to a neighbouring language, the way that Scots and English are similar. Um, there, was a, there was a kind of period of kind of national awakening in Europe where these countries like Norway kind of codified Norwegian to make it as different from Swedish as they could, you know, mm-hmm. purposefully different in a way. The same thing kind of was a process in Catalonia and various places. And Hugh McDermott was doing that for Scots. And, you know, again, Scottish cringe kicks in and we go, oh, synthesize Scots. We don't want to know. We don't want to know. And, you know, the whole Scots language movement, I, in my view, um, I'm not sure if this is controversial or not, but in my view, um, it massively weakens um, uh, weakens their ability to kind of um, grow the language, to teach it, to you know, you, you need to um, have a kind of codified um, version of, of the language. And it's, it shows how um, ill at peace we are with our culture, um, that, that we haven't kind of embraced those moments and built on them and, you know, and seen that as our tradition is evolving. Um, I suppose the same, the same with wearing of the kilt. You still hear, oh, that's not traditional, though. Like, well, it is now. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, we know Walter Scott kind of, designed the modern kilt outfit but it was based on highland dress which is a real thing mm-hmm. and it's now traditional that, that's that's natural you know countries nations traditions evolve and that's okay yeah you know, you know we're, we're part of a living culture a living tradition and it's okay that we can uh, add to that and make it appropriate for our own times um scotland really needs to kind of wake up to that and reappraise um our history and what we've done to our culture over the years and kind of celebrate it more embrace it more revive it yeah i think that's a perfect place to end it but thank you so much for coming on and chatting that was it was an amazing yeah. conversation You're welcome i think yeah everyone's going to benefit from that <laughs>
hopefully, hopefully um, my, my, as I say, I'm a, a supporter of Scots myself, but I've not been involved in the in any of the kind of recent campaigns. There's, uh, uh, there's now a Scots a Scots group kind of similar to Mishnach um, mm-hmm. called Urvice. Um and the Scots Language Centre have done some good work around the census as well, encouraging people to kind of fill it in. So yeah. um, there's more happening happening for Scots now. Uh, and I'm not involved in any of that. Um, so hopefully <laughs> there will be remarks there and, and um, too controversial. No, I don't think there will be. I mean, Scots is, uh, I mean, well, all of these languages, it's very nuanced and they all kind of come together to form the picture of the country that we live in. Mm-hmm. And uh, Yeah. So I think it's important, you know, what human damage was doing was important in my view. And uh, I think it's a real... Yeah, a real loss that, that that wasn't embraced and built on. And I do, I do see it as like a kind of cultural cringe moment to, to reject that and synthesize Scots. You know, mm-hmm. nobody's going around saying that, like, you know, top Norwegian is synthesized Norwegian. You know, mm-hmm. it is, but so. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's kind of it's part of, of evolution, it's making decisions as a society. And, you know, deciding to value our language and to and to codify it, mm-hmm. um, and just not being biased yeah, by yeah, ourselves. Yeah, I think that carries not just within our culture, but it's something that's just applicable to yourself as a person. I'm someone that would never be embarrassed by who I am. Do you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. just who you are. So why would that carry over yeah. to your culture or anything, anything similar? Yeah, I suppose the the difficulty is it's well a lot of these things they're so ingrained so even when you feel like that you're still going to have moments of yeah 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 it's it's kind of ingrained because it's part of your part of it's part of our upbringing in a way (laughs) we're kind of yeah it's part of what we're embracing is that yeah (laughs) it's that contradiction you know in that um yeah so yeah yeah like, like all these things i suppose um progressiveness attitudes you know you have to constantly kind of question yourself and and spot your your blind well try and identify your blind spots and stuff no but that was amazing man thank you so much thank you so much right. Martin. cheers now cheers. right